Test one, two, good. I don't have to, to type. I can talk. Yeah, I've announced it over at Concert Band Orchestration. Uh, I did not do it at Orchestration Online. Uh, if you'd like to, to share it over there, you're more than welcome to. And I'm still a little bit early on uh, time. I said I'd go live at noon and still another about six minutes before I'm officially live. Excellent. Yep. Uh, I've been meaning to do this and uh, would like to have done it a little bit sooner, but, you know, I was off of the continent for a week. So, you know, as you do. Hi guys, looks like we've got four people in the room now, and I'm still, like I said a moment ago, about uh, five minutes early, so start thinking of some questions to ask, I'll start thinking of some answers, because that's how it works, right? And I've got most of my instruments around here, if I need to break something out. Um, need be, I, I, I'll have to go into the other room and get some of the bigger ones, but yeah, you know, that's how it goes. Uh, yes, I will eventually make another G clarinet video. In fact, I've got mine uh, right here. Um, the problem is this horn sucks. Like, it really sucks. I've, I mean, I've done surgery to this instrument. I've, I've taken to the keys to the grinder. I've actually drilled holes in it to bring up the tuning, and it still sucks. So. Um, I will probably do a, a video on the suckitude of the G clarinet. It, and I, the problem is I, I have to differentiate between a G clarinet proper and this one. 
And I think that the G clarinet is a really viable instrument. Just um, don't get the Chinese made one. But I've got several other videos planned. Um, I have a, a new instrument that's literally in pieces on the ground that I'm waiting for. Uh, a new set of pads for that I'm going to be doing a video on. Hopefully here in the next couple weeks um, when all the pads come in. Which should be, I'm thinking Monday or Tuesday. I'm not who you think I am. What kind of uh, composing do you do? Uh, work on the symphony um, over the last about two weeks has been kind of non-existent, uh, only because I was on vacation, um, got a little bit sick, and I just uh, simply did not get any work done. So it's still sitting exactly where it was. Um, I plan on getting back to that uh, very soon. I've got the next section sketched out and planned. Um but it's it's slow going on it right now. I mean, I'm still sitting at about 30 minutes completely done. And, you know, I've got plans for like four other pieces in my head at the moment that I may have to take priority over the symphony. So we'll we'll see. But it it's slower going than I, I would like. That's, you know, what what you get when you tackle a, a huge piece, which Symphony 3 is. Um, Symphony 3 is turning out to be bigger than Symphony 2. It's not how I planned it, but it's what it's going to be. What's the purpose of offstage trumpets? Um, have you ever been in a... Um, it, this is something that really is so much better live than it will be on recording because it's the stereo effect. Essentially um, you have sound coming, get you from forward from the, the main ensemble. Then you've got it coming from the sides from the back. Um, there are times when you've got it behind the stage. So it sounds like it's coming from far away. Um, and it can be done for distance effects or it can be done for extra power effects. I haven't fully decided if I'm going to be using the odd offstage trumpets yet, though, but I'm pretty sure I am. Yeah, Mahler 2 is a, a great example of offstage uh, brass. Um, I have a great story about uh, the first time I ever heard Mahler 2. Um, it was my 18th birthday, and my uh, cousins happened to sing in the, the Dallas Symphony uh, Chorus. Um, and so they took me to an open rehearsal of Mahler II, and I am sitting in the, the Meyerson Symphony Center in downtown Dallas in a completely empty um, uh, <laughs> symphony hall hearing Mahler II by myself performed live, and it is one of the most incredible musical 
uh, experiences I've ever had. Um, you know, I probably will ever have because I think I don't think uh, very many people are ever going to get to hear a, a Mahler symphony played just to them. No, you're right, Jack. It doesn't come. Um, oh, the the new instrument I've got. Well, uh, it's in pieces right now. Um, I can get the body of it. Let me go grab that real quick. Uh, so. This is it. It's um, it's a D flat piccolo. Uh, if you don't know anything about the D flat piccolo, it's pitched half a step higher than the C piccolo. So here's a C piccolo and a D flat, and you can see D flat's just a hair shorter. Uh, and this is an old uh, con from about I think it's uh, 1928. Uh, solid silver that. Uh, was completely tarnished. I've taken it apart and uh, polishing it up, and the new set of pads is on its way. It really wouldn't play much before I got it, but it's, uh, like I said, it's in pieces. All the other pieces are right down there <laughs> on a piece of paper, but eventually I'll have, have this thing working, so I'll have a piccolo in C and a piccolo in D flat. Why? I don't know. But like I said, I'll do a whole video on uh, the D flat piccolo and why it exists or existed because they don't make them anymore. Forgive me while I eat brownies. Yes, Hulse used uh, both uh, D-flat piccolos and D-flat flutes in both of his suites, first suite and second suite. Um, of course, we don't uh, see those in the modern performing editions uh, simply because the the editors have uh, changed it over to normal C-flutes and C-piccolos. But it was uh, very much the the common practice in military bands to be using the D-flat instruments over the C instruments. And uh, one other thing about those, those old military bands is they did not play at A equals 440. They're playing at high pitch, so A equals 4... 57 usually, so almost uh, about a quarter step high. So the military band instruments could not be used in the orchestra. The orchestra instruments could not be used in the military bands, which uh, got into lots of problems. So one reason we don't see a, a lot of uh, military band instruments crossing over into orchestral literature All right, do we have any other questions? I know it's, this was a little bit of a impromptu uh, uh, get-together, but keep them coming. Any instruments you'd like to know about? Any uh, composition things, orchestration things?
Go for it. Uh, okay. Any um, Anything you'd suggest other than your own book for beginners for, uh, to writing for concert band? Um, honestly, not really. There's not... Uh, there's not really much else out there. Um, there, there are some smaller texts. There are, if you look at like instrument pedagogy text, you might be able to find uh, some information there. But it's not really directed at the composing aspect. It's directing at the teaching aspect, and it, a lot of times those will overlap. So if you look at the co the teaching side more as more than the composing side, I think you'll get uh, similar results. Is there a concert master in? The band like in the orchestra section leader um if there is someone designated as concert master it's going to be the first chair clarinetist b flat clarinet um this is not always the case um i know that when i go see the the dallas winds uh their first uh clarinet player is treated as the the concert mistress and um but again this is uh there really is not a similar role because, you know, the concert master's job really is to head up the whole string section. And since there's not really a whole string section, there's not as big of a need for the concert master. Uh, they aren't going to be there. They don't have to worry about marking in all the bowings for the parts because well, nobody bows anything. Now, well, unless you're bowing the vibraphone. Um, but, Uh, are you treated as the, the concert master or do you give the tuning note? Those are very, very different. Well, that, that's fine. Fine that you're not not part of a band. I mean, uh, I haven't played in a band in several years, but it's it's a little bit harder once you're uh, an adult and out of school. Uh, yeah, tuning tuning note is always the oboe, no matter concert master or not. Um, the fact that the band director is asking you to help out just means that they trust you, but it's not a role of concert master. Concert master in the orchestra is almost like the second conductor. Uh, they're usually the highest paid member of the orchestra. They have a lot more responsibilities. Um, they have to do a lot more than the other uh uh, just standard players, but in fact, uh, with tuning note, uh, the first time I played in an orchestra, uh, not the first time, but for quite a bit while I was in, uh, uh, undergrad um we didn't have any oboes in our orchestra so i playing first bassoon i gave the tuning note because nobody else would are you is you're the only oboe should you stand out or blend in yes uh depends on the music depends on the context um if you have a solo stand out if you are um within the context of everything else that's going on, blend in. Uh, oboe 
you know, oboe is not a great blending instrument, but it can. Uh, you are never going to blend perfectly with uh, clarinets in particular. Uh, you might be able to blend a little bit better with uh, some of the other instruments. Uh, oboes and flutes can blend in the upper register, but definitely not the lower register. Um, listen to what your band director tells you, honestly. Um, if the band director tells you to back off, back off, it's their job to, to balance and to worry about blending. It's your job to produce the best sound that you can possibly make. Have you ever seen an ocarina used in band music? Uh, in band music, no. Um, I, not to say that it can't, um, but I just have never seen a piece that used it. And I, I actually left Ocarina's out of my book, and I probably shouldn't have. It's probably one of those that I really should have put a little bit more time into. Uh, that said, I do know uh, at least one orchestral piece that uses ocarinas, and that's uh, the Ligeti Violin Concerto. Um, and where Ligeti has the entire woodwind section go and switch over to uh, ocarinas. And it's a weird sound. It's pretty eerie. Um, but outside of that, I don't know uh, anything else other than examples where it might be used. Um, I say if you're doing uh, a performance of The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, which is done on an ocarina. Uh, but otherwise, I don't really know any uh, examples. But check out the Ligeti Violin Concerto. All right, I'm finishing my brownie so you don't have to see me eat anymore. Yes, absolutely. I love the sound of um, saxophones and orchestral music. Um, uh, it's and I still I still need to go back and finish that series I was doing on um, saxophones in the orchestra. I've still got a lot more to do. Um, Uh, but yeah, the, the reason saxophones aren't seen in orchestra, it really has more to do with the musicians' union rules than composers not wanting to use them. Uh, yeah, first flutist playing recorder is not too uncommon. Um, one of these days I will probably use recorders in one of my band pieces, uh, considering recorder is one of my, my primary instruments. Um, I did more study on that in grad school than I did almost anything else. Uh, in general, orchestra and band, should the, let's use sciences like sopranino and bass be used more. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, sopranino, because of... Uh, the inexpensive Chinese instruments that are out now that you can get for 500 bucks um, and that play really well, like in tune and have a nice sound. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think that's going to be one of the instruments that's really going to start being seen and used a lot more. Uh, bass saxophone is definitely having a, a resurgence right now. Um. Uh, I use bass saxophone in 
nearly every band piece I do now, unless it's written for a younger group. You know, I'm I'm a, a big bass sax fan. If they made more of them, Kano sax should be used. Um, yes, Kano saxes are interesting. I'd actually probably prefer just the regular old F altos, the F mezzo sopranos. I've had the chance to play both a Kano sax and an F alto, and I will say hands down, those are my two absolute favorite sounding saxophones I have ever heard or played. Um, the Kano sax was a, was a trip, you know, because it's had a, a built-in three octave range on it already without having to resort to any altissimo. Uh, but the fact that I was holding in my hands an instrument worth $100,000, it's a woodwind, not a, you know, a violin. You know, I'm physically shaking when I was holding it, but I... Uh, what a beautiful sounding instrument, though. And actually, with uh, F alto, the old mezzo soprano, uh, I am including a part for it in Symphony 3. So I've got uh, notes for it in the symphony. And I do know where to get one. Or I've actually got a few friends who have them, so I can get it if needed. But something like the the Kano sax, I do not foresee uh, them being made again. Um, it'd be, I mean, the the scenario I would envision is a, a Chinese company basically cloning them. But in order to clone them, they'd have to have one to clone, and nobody's going to give up one of theirs because uh, there's only twenty five of them in existence, roughly. And it would involve a complete disassembly, and I don't think anybody's going to really want that to happen. The the F alto, they're much more common, and I could see that being done a little easier. Uh, using a bass oboe or heckle phone in a band setting is good. Absolutely, it's good. I mean, those are fantastic instruments. Um, they are very different instruments, so you have to realize. He bass oboe and heckle phone are, are really not as similar as orchestration books make them out to be. Um, in most of my larger works, I will have a bass oboe part. Um, and, and really, the, the new new kid on the block is is the Lupophone. That's uh, Wolf's uh, bass oboe that goes down to low F. And that's actually what I'm writing for in Symphony 3 right now. Um, as far as um, pieces that use them for uh, band setting, I only know uh, one. Uh, that's, well, of course, not by me. but And that's uh, Granger's Children's March. Um one of Granger's earliest pieces for wind band, and he uses two oboes and a bass oboe in it. No English horn at all, though most often it is played on an English horn because, well, there's not a lot of bass oboes out there. So, but that that one piece is about all I know. Uh, there might be others, but they're going to be super rare and obscure pieces. I take that back. As I finish up my coffee, I real I remembered one other. Um, the Penderecki's uh, Pittsburgh Overture has a hecklephone part in it. What do you think about instrument ampli amplification on quieter instruments like bass flute or celeste? Um, would it be no longer considered acoustic sound if processed through an amplifier? Bass flute gets amplified all the time. Um, th there's not really a problem with it. Um, a professional bass flutist will usually bring a small speaker with them if they are 
really accustomed to doing that. Uh, that said, uh, when I score for either of those instruments, um, I score for them in a way that you don't need amplification. Um, and I, I think that instruments like bass flute have this uh, compounding effect that we say that they're soft. We think that they're soft. In, in reality, they're not as soft as we think they are, um, especially if you just keep out of the, you know, the bottom fifth of the range of the instrument. Um, just like any flute that just gets soft down there, but in the, in the normal everyday playing range of a flute and just not, you know, bass flute specific, um, as long as you're scoring for them lightly, there's not as huge of a need for an amplifier. As far as celeste, I, I don't know of any situation where you really need to amplify a celeste. Um, in in Hollywood, they actually don't use real celeste. They use a synthesizer, but that's only because uh, mechanical uh, celestes have a a real clunk in their keywork, and when they're uh, mic'd closely, you'll pick up a lot of that um, key action. Uh, why do you think beginner band composers like to use the bassoon as part of the bass line instead of having its own melody? I don't think beginner band composers think about the bassoon, honestly, uh, because most of the time you get that infamous trombone, baritone, BC bassoon part, which uh, as a bassoonist pisses me off to no end because it's like, oh, look, I'm a third afterthought. And... Um, but but the reality is most uh, beginner bands won't have bassoons. They, um, you know, if you are going to have a bassoon and you want to give it its own part, you want to make sure it's there. So bassoon is, like I said, it's, it's an afterthought, for better or worse. Um to get melodic stuff, it, it you know, it, as a bassoon, you know, the first thing you learn is the basic F scale, everything within the staff. Um, and as you go up higher and higher, you have to do more advanced techniques like half holding and flicking, and it becomes a little bit uh, more of a challenge for a beginner player. Uh, it's something that should be, you know, tackled pretty well by second or third year, but for the beginner, that second octave is a little bit more difficult. Yes, I absolutely agree. I hate the trombone, baritone, bassoon part. Um, and, and I talk about this quite a bit in, in my book, uh, especially volume one, is uh, the psychological aspect for a young player seeing a, a trombone, baritone, bassoon part. It's like, oh, you didn't think about me. I'm not important. I'm just going to goof off now because nobody cares about me. Nobody loves me. But yeah, uh, parts like that, the, the, the real psychological effect for uh, young bassoonists, I think, is really damaging. Are you planning to include the Soprillo saxophone in your future works? Um, I have not yet. Um, simply because I don't know why, actually. Um, I don't necessarily need another super high uh, reed instrument in my works. Um, the Soprano sax is great for a, um, a brilliant high solo part. Um, that said, they're, they're, they are extremely difficult to play. Uh, I, I will use, uh, Sopranino, uh, really frequently, um, because I've got one, I've got uh, a bit of experience with it. Uh, Soprillos are so new and so 
really untested. I don't know any large scale uh, work right now that uh, uses the instrument outside of saxophone ensembles. In, in fact, in my, my big saxophone ensemble that was premiered um, a few weeks ago, uh, I did not have a soprillo part, but surprisingly, there were two contrabass saxophones. I'm still waiting to get the recording of that, and hopefully I'll be able to upload that here in the next couple weeks. But yeah, there were two contrabass saxophones on stage. Also, with beginner band composers, why do you have oboe playing the same as the flute, but it's an octave lower? Okay, um, this is a, a little bit easier um, question to ask. Um, flute, uh, so oboe and flute have different uh, dynamic tendency. Oboe gets louder as it goes lower. Flute gets louder as it goes higher. So they really cross paths. And if you want to balance them, you want the oboe on bottom and the flute on top. If you switch them, you're just going to get oboe and you won't get any flute. Um, and that's that's just um, a harmonic thing. That's a pretty um, just simple scientific thing if you just look at the actual sounds of it. Flutes naturally play higher. Uh, a, you know, a, you know, you're not going to expect oboes really, a beginner oboe to really go much above the staff, whereas a beginner flute player can go quite a bit higher than that. Um, I've seen beginner flute players go all the way up to like high Fs above the staff, you know, the very, very top note of the oboe or one of the top notes. All right, what else we got? Uh, what do I think of the, the Muset Piccolo oboe? First thing, I, I, I've I voiced this opinion many times before. I hate the name Muset for it uh, because there are two instruments that go by the name Muset. Properly, a Muset is a bagpipe or a bagpipe chanter. So I never use the term Muset. Piccolo oboe um, or Sopranino oboe is actually uh, probably the most correct. Uh, I have played one once, but it has been so long since I played it. It's been over a decade, um, well over a decade now, maybe 12, 14 years since I've, I've uh, even seen one. Um, it's an untapped um, possibility. Uh, the, the problem is there are so few of them out there that... It becomes difficult to um, uh, to really know the availability, uh, and very few people are prepared to play them. Uh, I included a, a, a F piccolo oboe in Symphony Number no. One uh, only because that uh, symphony is written entirely for double reeds. Um, so that's just you know one of those. Uh, things um, I know one um, movie score that uses piccolo oboe uh, the original Jurassic Park has parts for the E flat piccolo oboe the Sopranino oboe um, how do you get the flutes, uh, the, the train sound on flute? Well, you'd have to be a little bit more specific. I don't know exactly what train sound you're talking about. You're talking about the, the jet whistle. Uh, if you could add one instrument to a standard concert band setting, what would it be? Um, I pretty much always go back to, to bass oboe on this. That uh, Just get that rich middle tenor voice in the double reed section to really start filling out your um, middle woodwinds. Uh, of course, that's assuming we already have uh, alto or tenor clarinets in there, which should be standard. Sarusophone. Uh, okay, now, now, now you're up my alley. I probably... <laughs> know more about Sarusophone than should be allowed by law. Um, uh, jet Whistle. Well, let me see if I can show you. I've got my flute over here. Uh, 
if I remember correctly, <coughs> is that what you're talking about? Basically, to do the jet whistle, you just put your mouth completely over the embouchure hole and blow in and change the air direction. Let's see if it works on, on Piccolo, too. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned there being a reason saxophone players tend to stay away from classical playing, but you said, um, well, yeah, uh, saxophone players tend to stay away from classical playing because there's no jobs. You're not going to get hired. Um, most of the, the saxophone players I know make their living playing jazz. And so it, Um, so it, and it's, it's just as simple as where's the money. Now that said, uh, most good saxophone players will be able to play in both worlds. Um, but you know, good, good player should be able to play in multiple styles. Um, I, I think that's the effect used by Whitaker though. Don't quote me on it because I have not heard that particular piece since I played it in 2000. So, God, it's 18 years. God, I'm old. Yeah. Anyway. Lucas, did that, that kind of answer your, your question a little bit, or do you need a little bit more detail on that? All right. Anybody got any other questions? We'll probably go about till till one o'clock till end of the hour, unless we start getting a bunch more people in here and a lot more questions coming in. But I'll stick around for another twenty five minutes or so. Uh, voice crossing. Okay. All right, so I got three questions coming in at once. Uh, so I'll just tackle Stevens first. Uh, big one. What do you think of uh, voice crossings if they're used sparingly or having an effect in a lower range instrument to play above a higher one? Perfectly fine is um, if you know if you know what you're doing. Um, I've had instances where I'll take a really high bassoon and have that be the the top voice. Um, if you know what you're doing and you know how to balance it, it can create some really, really wonderful effects. I mean, go back and check out um, Rite of Spring. Um, Rite of Spring is one of those that he just flips everything around to create all these new sounds and does it masterfully. You know, low instruments playing in the high register, high instruments playing in the low register. Have I ever written anything for brass band? Not yet, but that is one of the pieces I'm about to start. I do have a brass band piece that um, is in the works. Uh, I've uh, started sketching out some ideas for it while I was on my vacation. Um, but yeah, I, I, I've got, got a piece planned out. I just have to start getting notes on the page. You think intermediate band music should start teaching contemporary techniques? I don't see why not. Um, I know that John Mackey just wrote a new piece for junior high band. And I know for a fact, because he posted it on Facebook, that he included saxophone multiphonics in it. 
for a junior high piece. So it's being done. Uh, there are pieces out there that use that kind of stuff. I remember maybe not uh, in junior high, but definitely by high school, uh, going to all region bands and whatnot. And we were playing pieces that use quite a bit of uh, contemporary techniques. Um, we had one piece. I remember we did it in an all state band where the entire band got off the stage, encircled the entire audience and the compo the conductor stood in the middle of the audience and just pointed. And I cannot, cannot remember what piece that is for the life of me, but there are plenty of pieces that do that. Uh, I've heard commonly used with cellos and violas. Yeah. And it works quite well with those instruments. It works well as long as um, the only instruments you really have to worry about uh, the, that voice crossing is really going to be like flutes and oboes where the, the dynamic ranges are so disparate from one another. All right, what else we got? You think there's a place for using two types of tubas, E flat and B flat? Yes, absolutely. In fact, uh, the majority of my uh, larger band works, I have uh, parts for uh, bass and contrabass tuba. I don't specify E flat or B flat, but I just specify bass and contrabass. So if the player wants to bring an F tuba and a C tuba, that's, you know, instead of E flat and B flat. But yeah, absolutely. Um, I got really turned on to the idea of using um, the bass tuba, the E flat or the F, uh, the first time I heard uh, Oystein Bodzvik live. He was playing, um, I guess still does, plays the E flat tuba exclusively. And man, after hearing pretty much exclusively B flat and C tubas for my entire life, hearing the smaller tuba, just eye opening what it can do. And I, I really like the idea of having both of them. So the bass and the contrabass. But when I do that, of course, I only really use one of each. So one bass, one contrabass. Yeah, E flat tuba is not something that we really see here in the U.S. Um, they're the, if we ever see E flat tubas, they're specialist instruments or they're antiques. If instrument makers made a B flat oboe, what would it? What would be its purpose? Um, I don't know what its purpose would be uh, to play a whole step lower, but really to play a whole step lower, we've got the oboe de more and a um, B flat oboes have existed in the past. Um, there were some military B flat oboes made. Uh, I don't see why such an instrument couldn't be made, um, but I don't know because you've already got an uh, instrument in C, an instrument in A, an instrument in F to fill in a B flat there. Um, you might have it <coughs> without knowing um, an exact sound. It'd be real hard to, to judge why you'd need it, why you'd want it. But I could see it being a possibility. A lot of funny looks with my E flat when I attended the international music camp in North Dakota a few years ago. In, in Ireland, where I live, it's nearly exclusively E flat with some B flat, not much else. Yeah. Um, the E flat tuba, like I said, really does not uh, have a footing here in the US. Uh, students use B flat, professionals use C and F. The E flat is. The E flat is pretty much exclusively used in uh, British music and uh, with British players. <clears throat> so you don't, uh, you know, Oystein Bodzvik may be one of the few players outside of the, the British sphere of influence that plays on the E flat quite a bit. But 
otherwise, yeah, E flat uh, is kind of died out everywhere else. Americans, Germans, and the rest of Europe will use the F uh, for the bass tuba, and then Americans use C uh, for the contrabass, and Germans use the B flat for the contrabass. Though there are some players in the U.S. who are actively looking at using B flat tubas again for professionals uh, and orchestras. Uh, it, it's the point of having a baritone or tuba part playing in treble clef. Um, it's just, uh, if you look at a British brass band, every instrument is in treble clef, except for the bass trombone. And there's historical reasons why the bass trombone was never put in treble clef. It's just a matter of transposing, uh, just like Barry sax and bass clarinet are in treble clef. Um, uh, baritone or euphonium or tuba in the, the brass band world are in trouble clef. It, they just transpose. What instruments do I think need to be invented? <coughs> oh, my, um, there, there are a few. Um, one of the, the sounds that I think really should be modernized is a Cylindrical bore double reed instrument, uh, basically akin to the old crumb horns. It we've got conical bore double reed instruments in the oboes and bassoons, and to some extent the the old sarusophones. But the the uh, cylindrical bore that overblows the twelfth like a clarinet would never made it, and it's a very very different sound than what we're used to. Essentially, be a uh, Double reed clarinet. Uh, there are some gaps between instruments that need to be filled. Um, I, I am a huge advocate for somebody someday making an instrument between the bassoon and the contrabassoon. Um, uh, and instruments an octave lower than the English horn and an octave lower than the bass oboe. So what would essentially, uh, if we take the, the bass oboe and really call it a tenor, which it is, then you get a baritone and a bass below that. Uh, as you can see, it, I'm kind of heavily leaning toward the double reeds, but they're really the only incomplete families we have. Flutes have everything. Um, new, uh, new saxophones in F would be nice. Uh, yeah, if we bring back the, the F alto saxophone, um uh that would be great. Um the F baritone would be interesting. I could see it being a very lyrical instrument. Um that said, none have ever existed. Okay, this question might be a bit subjective, but how does one avoid cliche? Che uses of instruments. Are there parts or roles for certain instruments you wish weren't so overused? Um, um, I don't know. I, I think that's a, like you said, it's a really subjective question. The cliche uses. Could you be a little bit more specific? Give me a like a specific example where you've got a cliche use of an instrument. Because so I'm a, a lot of times the the cliche uses are there because that's the role that the instrument fills really well. Um. Are there any instruments in the standard band lineup that you don't like to use much? I don't use trumpets much. In fact, I'm not using trumpets at all in Symphony 3 outside of uh, probably use in the finale. Um, it depends on the piece, on what I'm using. Um, the, the more I write, the the more familiar I get with how to use everything. Uh, one that I, I try to avoid as much as possible is snare drum. I really don't like the snare drum unless I'm writing something military in style. What instrument do you think should use alto clef if you can change their clef? Um, I think clefs are fine as they are. 
Um, I've heard uh, some argument being made that horns, uh, French horns, could be better done if they were written in concert pitch using alto clef. And if you think about their um, their range, it fits alto clef quite nicely. But, you know, um, I think everything's fine as is. Uh, yeah, bassoon being used as a bass all the time. Yeah, that that's a cliche that a lot of uh, younger band composers and less experienced band composers will run across. And that's one of the few, though, that bassoon just gets used as bass all the time. And we never get out of our low register. Yeah, Bar uh, Barry Sachs, you know, one reason I like using uh, a bass sax, it frees up the berry sax to get up into its upper register because the upper register of the berry sax is my favorite register of it. Uh, it's coming from someone who uh, really baritone sax is, is my true secondary. I've been playing it nearly as long as I've played bassoon. Yes, low reed should be used more than low brass. Um, just simply... Low brass is there for power. Low reeds are there for depth. Uh, I use them exactly like an orchestral uh, composer would use them. The trombones and tubas are much more limited in their use. That said, there are going to be fewer players on the low reeds because low reed instruments tend to be the most expensive. So... You know, the most expensive and generally the most fragile. Um, the um, uh, yeah, so e exactly, Lucas. The bass sax is expensive. Contra alto clarinet's not really that expensive. Um, I've I've got kind of a deal struck up on one to to buy a contra alto. I'm just kind of waiting to to close the deal and start payments on it, but. You can get them for under a thousand bucks. Uh, bass sax, on the other hand, not so much. Five thousand would be a good starting price for a bass sax used and old. Um, but yeah, you just don't. It's it's a financial thing, really, with the the low reads. Uh, I would love to have uh, almost e equal numbers of B flat clarinets and low clarinets. Uh, would I say that the low reeds are basically the cellos of the band? No, I'd say the low reeds are the low reeds of the band. If we start thinking uh, in terms of, is this a cello? Is this a viola? It um, really takes away from the fact that we're writing for these instruments and not those instruments. And so think of it more as... I'm writing specifically for the bass clarinet. I'm writing specifically for the bassoon. I'm writing specifically for the berry sax. I'm not trying to emulate the sound of a cello. Now, I know how to do that, uh, but if I'm writing more for the instruments that I'm writing for. I think I get a better end product. Uh, when would you write for alto clarinet versus basset horn? Uh, I have done both. Um, so uh, my piece Omnia Excellent in Mysterium has a, a basset horn part, an F alto clarinet. Um, and I just chose that for the little bit lighter tone color, a um, little bit more, you know, available to professionals. Um, but anymore, I'm, I'm writing for, uh, alto clarinets or as, as I pretty much always put it in my scores now is tenor clarinet because that's the role it is. And that's its old name. Um, I've only scored for both of them at the same time once. And that's in symphony two, where I have, uh, two bassets and two altos. And I talk about this in the book quite a bit where, um, I use those essentially as woodwind horns. So this soft inner middle voices uh, to really compete against the, the horns. And they just fill out these nice inner harmonies. 
Um, but th that said, a lot of times they're interchangeable with one another. You're not going to hear a huge audible difference. Um, case in point, I know that the, the Dallas wins, uh, one of the big uh, professional wind bands in the country, they recorded a Granger CD a couple years ago, and they used a, a Bassett horn instead of the alto clarinet on all the alto clarinet parts. And I don't think anybody can tell. So they're pretty interchangeable. Thoughts on doubling uh, with oboes and clarinets specifically. I read somewhere, I uh, don't remember the source, but it said that oboe and clarinet unison should be avoided. Okay, um, here, here's why a lot of people will tend to avoid that mixture. Um, it's the difference between a saw wave and a square wave. So you've basically got two competing wave patterns that don't really mix well. Uh, that said, they can. Um, uh, the best example of it is the opening melody. Uh, is it the opening melody or the second melody of Schubert's Eighth Symphony, The Unfinished? Yeah, and that's exactly right. So Schubert, um, um, if you, he's got this great uh, unison uh, part between the two instruments. Uh, and, uh, it works well. And I think it works in spite of the fact that it should be avoided. So it's a, it just produces an interesting color. Uh, I remember said don't like orchestral transcriptions for band, but what do you think of orchestrations from piano pieces? Oh yeah. Uh, if you are completely changing the context of it. So I'm, I'm basically, I've been thinking a lot about this lately is in terms of um, art in general. If you cannot improve upon something, change it entirely. And I don't think anybody can really improve on an orchestral transcription, go from orchestra to band. There's no way you can... Um, make that better. You might make it equal, but you're not going to make it better. Whereas if you are going from piano to band, piano to orchestra, you're making that um, totally different and they can really stand apart from one another. How come most uh, country-based folk songs for band use an alto saxophone solo at the beginning? I don't know what you're talking about. I... I don't know any example of that. Uh, also, second movement of whole second suite. Uh, oh man, I have to go get my score to that. Uh, is it in here? Uh, it's right here. I'd have to find it in this lovely stack. There we go. There's the second suite. <coughs> uh, yeah. You know, that's to Kelly, and we're, we, we won't talk about to Kelly because he doesn't know how to orchestrate. I think some of this with the, the Holst second suite is one, the, the version that we play has been heavily edited. Uh, lots of stuff has been added. Um, and so it's a little bit more uh, difficult. Uh, let me uh, hold off on that one bit. I got to run and grab something real quick.
Okay. Is the Wagner tuba actually considered a tuba? No. The Wagner tuba is a, a essentially a modified horn. It's played by horn players using a horn mouthpiece. It's it's a hybrid instrument. So it it's basically an upright wide bore horn. So they really cannot play their, their fundamental to pedal tone. The the B flat tenor volume tuba might, the F bass volume tuba can't. So they're they're more in the horn family. Um, as far as the second suite, no, I don't know anybody who has done a original version of the second suite. The first suite, uh, the closest you'll get will be the Frederick Fennell, uh, ed edition of it. Uh, Fennell goes back to the original manuscript. He adds a few things in. He adds uh, Barry Sax in. He adds bass clarinet in, which are not in the original. Otherwise, I think everything is the same as the original. Because uh, you know, Holst did not score for alto clarinet, bass clarinet, Barry Sax, double bass, uh, second alto sax is an addition, but he does have parts for both baritone and euphonium, and the baritone part usually gets lost. Uh, one reason I always suggest if people are going to study Holst's band writing to study Hammersmith over, um, over either of the suites. What do you think of some of the more brass band specific instruments like the E flat horn or the soprano cornet? Uh, yeah, I I love those instruments. Uh, Symphony Two has parts for alto horn and for baritone horn, so I borrow a quartet from the brass band. I've yet to use the E flat cornet. Um, of course, I will be when I start working on the brass band piece. Uh, it's such a an interesting sound that um, I, I wish it would be incorporated more. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I'd love to see both of those instruments get used more and not uh, for like something like the alto horn as a, a substitute for the F horn. Uh, what woodwind instruments has the best alto tenor voice? Define best. I don't. I, I don't play the best game. Do you think it's a waste of money to buy a F Bassett clarinet if you already have an alto clarinet? Different functions, different roles. Um, the alto clarinet, of course, is going to be considerably cheaper. You know, I bought my essentially professional alto clarinet for 300 bucks and then spend another couple hundred fixing it up repadding um putting peg on making it uh, a better playing instrument uh whereas the same thing with a basset horn um minimum you're getting away is five thousand so it's a 10 it's essentially a 10 times the investment um, that said, um, you will find lots of uses for uh, the basset horn if you're playing chamber music, rarely orchestral stuff. Uh, you'll get called most often to play the Mozart Requiem. But uh, if you have the money, get both. Do fugues work well with wind instruments? Yes, period. Uh, oh. <sighs> Yeah, I mean, find any uh, transcription of a Bach um, uh, prelude and fugue or Dakota and fugue, and um, 
you will uh, yeah, fugues work extremely well in for anything almost. I mean, it's just a form. It it, it really doesn't have much to do with orchestration. A good orchestrator can orchestrate a fugue in their sleep. And it, it's fun to do. You consider the alto drum viable. Yeah, it's viable. It's a great instrument. Um, why wouldn't it be? Um, I mean, it's been used for hundreds of years. Uh, in band music, are you referring to band music in, in general or just the alto trombone in general? Because if you're talking about band music in general, uh, it's a little bit harder to come by than uh, it will be in orchestra. In orchestra, your first trombone player will typically uh, play alto trombone. It's kind of required nowadays. Uh, band music, it's it's rarely seen. Um, when I back is a, as an undergrad, I did a performing edition of Mendelssohn's Trauma Music and their tower march and the original was for alto tenor and bass trombone and i kept it as alto tenor and bass trombone in the the modern edition so the player you know played on a tenor but was reading off the alto part they didn't like me much but that was what was requested by the the conductor and said and he said get over it you got to learn how to do it um but yeah, for that lighter, higher sound, I I like using the alto trombone. Um, I use it in Symphony Two uh, throughout the whole piece, and there's this great moment right uh, toward the end of the piece uh, where I've just got the five trombones playing by themselves for like a minute or so straight, and the alto trombone just soars right up to a high F, and ah. Uh, that's one of my favorite moments of the whole piece. I read a master's thesis online a while back about organ transcriptions for band because the different wind instruments can imitate the different characters of uh, different organ registrations. Thoughts? Yes, I have two full chapters on this in volume one of my book. Uh, I spent actually quite a bit of time dealing with it in the book. Um, but yeah, uh, the wind band is very much like the organ. Speaking of organ, uh, um, lo and behold, Mr. Eccentric Brett bought one yesterday. It's sitting in my garage right now. I've got to do some repair on it, but I own an organ. So, yeah, that's going to be my uh, uh, next uh, experiment. Ah, yes. So... Yeah, I, I'm going to be definitely experimenting with this. It's um, uh, early 1920s uh, harmonium that I bought. And it works okay. It's um, it's it's got a lot of work to be done on it though. Yeah, JSTOR it, it would be a great resource if it were available to be read it, other than through the first page. I, you know, I've I, doing research. I come across it all the time. It's like, ah, and you have to pay 40 bucks to read the rest of this article. Probably be easier if you're in college and the university's paying for it. But once you're out of college, it's hard to read that stuff. So take it full advantage of it while you're there. Uh, band pieces that use organ. Yes. Um, I love band pieces that use organ. I use it in Symphony 2. Uh, very, uh, uh, very sparingly, but it works well. Um, you know, um, in fact, my first uh, band piece is the uh, Adagio for Winds and Organ. So it's this piece for you know, winds and organ, as the name su suggests. Uh, it's a really successful combination. Uh, I really, really like it. Um, 
there's the uh, Hindemith Kammer Music. I want to say it's Kammer Music number six for Winds in Oregon. Um, there's several Granger pieces. Uh, oh, Power of Rome and the Christian Heart by Granger. Man, find that piece and study it. There's um, a YouTube video of it where it's got the scrolling score to it. Uh, sadly, I don't think anybody has done a full score to that piece yet um, because it's just in Granger's weird short score. Um, what, most underrated instrument. Oh, that's a, that's a, a loaded question. Um, uh, I would say that underrate if we're just going to go with standard instruments i think something like uh, baritone sax is probably really underrated uh by composers uh, i i think that it's probably got the most potential and it's had the least usage uh Uh, which piece are you talking about, Jack? I rambled off a whole bunch of them. Should you learn alto trombone if you want to get into the high school orchestra or jazz band? No, it's really something you're going to pick up more in college. Jazz band does not use alto trombone. Uh, alto trombone is only read in alto clef. Uh, the, the Granger piece is Power of Rome and the Christian Heart. It's got Granger's... Um, Short score, but Granger never produced full scores for his pieces. One of his lovely quirks. You know, any good sound libraries for wind instruments? Uh, I am not... Uh, I'm not really into the sound library uh, world. I actually, for everything, I just use the Garretton sounds. So I've got uh, the Garretton built in for finale. I've also got a uh, concert uh, and marching band uh, Garretton, and then the jazz and big band for Garretton. And I use those pretty exclusively. Uh, and as Eric says, note performer, note performer for Sibelius, if you don't have it, uh, does not uh, exist on Finale. Uh, what program are you using to write with? That might be helpful. Why is F horn music typically easy in middle school? Because everything is uh, easy in middle school. Uh, horn uh, being as finicky and as nuanced as it is, you're not going to be giving them technical parts. You don't give them technical parts in orchestral music either. Uh, oh, you're using Dorico. Uh, we're not going to address Muse score because we don't we don't talk about Muse score. Uh, I've never used Dorico to be honest. Um, I can't really, um, I, I can't comment on, on Dorico. I'm sorry on that one. Uh, I'm sure that Dorico can run on any built in, uh, any, um, third market, uh, sorry, um, third-party VSTs, um, but it's not an area that I'm as familiar with. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Uh, do you know any unusual pieces with weird percussion instruments? My band used a bing bag chair to replace maracas. Um... Sure, there's lots of unusual percussion. Uh, you just got to know the literature more. Uh, the more uh, modern stuff you'll get, the more interesting stuff you'll get. Um, note flight is okay for beginners. Again, I don't know note flight. Is that one of the those? Free online programs. 
at some point, those, those programs really, uh, you're going to be limited on what you can do. And you really should not be using that kind of stuff for writing band music because there's too many uh, nuances on it. Jack or Eric, if you're able to find that again, you can send me a copy too. I, I'd um, I'd like to see it. I've I've got a whole bookshelf full of dissertations and theses on uh, different instruments, so I can always add to my collection there. That's uh, one reason I'm able to uh, you know talk as much as I am about the subject is. I've got a bookcase full of all this stuff that I've I've studied for 20 years more uh, 25 nearly 30 years yeah uh, per sentiment you're absolutely right uh, stuff like muse score is is good for a, a beginner but if you want to, to do anything past beginner stuff, you've got to have Sibelius, Finale, or Dorico. Uh, um, so, tell what, uh, Jack, I'm going to put my email here, and if you can send me a, a copy of it. Uh, intermediate band composers should use instrument doublings, for example, oboe, English horn, bassoon, to contrabassoon. Intermediate band pieces probably are not going to be using English horn or contrabassoon. Um, I think those are probably uh, bad examples of that. Um, the probably the the only realistic example would be B flat to E flat clarinet or alto to soprano sax. So uh, that, that'd be about it. Um, it. It's completely doable or uh, something flute to piccolo yeah, uh, on that. Uh, but if you're doing, if you're using English horn and contrabassoon, you're not writing an intermediate band piece. Um, yeah, a, an entire orchestration of Vidor's Fifth Symphony. I'd love to see that. So typically, if, uh, when we're saying intermediate band, I'm assuming something along the lines of junior high, second, third, maybe fourth year players. These are players who are still learning. It's not um, something that you really need to be worried about the uh, player switching to another instrument. Yeah, e email is fine. Um, I, I think that'd probably be better. Started a Muse score because it was three, though I'm now using Dorico. Oh, yeah, mo money's going to be short. You're a musician. Money will always be short. Uh, advanced eighth grade and ninth grade. Um, yeah, uh, again... I would not be putting English horn or contrabassoon or things like that in something for a, an eighth grade band unless, and this is a big unless, unless you know the particular band that you'd be writing for. Uh, case in point, I wrote a piece for junior high uh, earlier this year, and I know for a fact that they have an English horn and they have a player who plays it. So in that case, uh, I included an English horn, but I did not have the player going back and forth between the two. And that's a very rare circumstance, but it can happen.
Yeah, one of these days I'm going to have to to try out Dorico. Um, I'm I'm a, a big Finale user. I've been using Finale since '98. Um, I had to learn to use Sibelius last year, and it is so backwards that you know I've got it, but I I almost never use it unless I'm doing uh, some commercial scoring, where you know the files come in in Sibelius, and I just got to work in Sibelius. Yep, uh, I'll I'll stay here uh, for a little bit longer, maybe another 10, 15 minutes. Um, if uh, you know, as long as the questions keep coming in, I'll I'll answer as many as I can. But you know, I know there's not nearly as many people here um, that, as on the last one. This was you know, I didn't advertise this one as much. What do you think about composers? Uh, like to write pieces about history. My favorite is the great locomotive chase. Write a piece about whatever you want. Uh, as long as it's good, I have no problem with it. Uh, history is a great example. Um, if you have not, watch the video I uploaded last night. Um, it talks about uh, where inspiration comes from. It's uh, the most complex video I have ever made. Uh, if you have not watched it, it's um, took about two weeks to do. Uh, what should be my main focus? Range, tone, or speed and agility? Yes, 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 and yes. Uh, tone comes first. Tone should always come first. The more, The better tone you get, the better everything you get. Any tips on scoring for contrabass woodwinds so that they're not just all playing unison part for uh, varied contra woodwind parts? Uh, okay, let's see. Let me think about this. Uh, in general, there, I other than myself, I can't think of right now any composers who really treat the, the Contra woodwinds um, independently or with any true nuance. Uh, David Maslanka did. Um, I'd check out his fourth symphony. There's uh, really good independent parts for the Contra bass clarinet and the Contra bassoon. Um, other than that one, though, man... Uh, maybe his eighth symphony too, because that one also has a bass saxophone part in it. Uh, so, um, so uh, other than the tips, what do I tend to do with the contra parts? Uh, typically contra clarinet I use as a supporting instrument. It, because it, it lacks a lot of the over, the higher overtones, it's much more a sustain. I don't use it as much as a solo. Uh, Contra Bassoon, I use it much more for just this rich, reedy sound. Um, add a little bit of uh, pungency to it. A little bit uh, more uh, as a solo voice, I'll use the Contra Bassoon. Uh, I use that much more for, for weight than I will for the Contra Clarinets. And again, I usually nowadays use both uh, the contra alto and the contra bass together. Uh, what would you use contra? Yeah, I, okay. I think I just answered that one. Uh, what's the point of having a double, double bass if you can't hear it as much? Um, I have gone back and forth on double bass scoring. Uh, I have not used it in a piece of mine until... Symphony 3 that I'm writing right now. And only because I've been listening to more and more um, modern pieces that use double bass. And what's happening is a lot of the, the bigger ensembles are actually going to two double basses. So I just live down the road from um, uh, UNT, and I'm able to go see the UNT uh, wind, wind Symphony there. And they use two. 
And with two, you really can hear it. And it um, just, it's a, it's a different sound. It's, um, and I'm growing to where I, I like it. Uh, yeah, if you're putting the, the double bass in unison with the tubas, then pff, why have them? But if you're treating them uh, very differently as, well, double basses, then it works really well. Uh, particularly uh, using them with pizzicato. Um, the pizzicato parts are, I think, uh, really important. Uh, again, if you want to study good double bass writing in band, uh, go back to David Maslanka. He understood how to use uh, double bass better than really any band composer I've seen. Um, there was a... Um, one of the last band concerts I went to, uh, they did the John Mackey uh, soprano saxophone concerto. And there's a great passage in it where it's uh, just marimba and pizzicato bass. And the, the bass functions as like a bass marimba. And it works surprisingly well. So uh, there, there, there are options for it. And I'm getting to the point where I'm kind of liking the idea of bases in there. So, all right, what else we got? Yeah, Eric, you say it's with multiple tubas. And I think that's, that's one uh, thing with band that's, a limiting factor is that it's multiple tubas. I don't think any band needs more than two tubas. That's it, two. Unless there is the VC part where you absolutely need more than two, but two should be really the limit. You don't need any more. Orchestras get by fine with one, and it can be heard over a hundred players. I mean, very rarely will an orchestra ever need two tubas, something like Alpine Symphony or Rite of Spring. But even then, Rite of Spring was actually conceived for really uh, instruments the size of a euphonium. Uh, larger bands, seven around 70. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, even, you know, my my Symphony 2 is uh, has 80 players in it and still only two tubas. Uh, what modern band composers do you recommend? Most band music I listen to from people like Granger and Holst. I'm a small band that plays lots of transcriptions. Yes, I like Maslanka. Um, um, John Mackey is growing on me. I would really suggest listening to his uh, Frozen Cathedral. That is, I think, his absolute best piece. Um, Johan de May. Uh, he, I, I, I absolutely love DeMay's uh, first symphony. And I've, I've talked to Johan quite a bit about it. Um, talked to John Mackey as well. And well, I've talked to Miss Laika a bit too. Um, who else do I really like nowadays? Um, there's a lot of, uh, of good pieces that I just don't really know for for um, the modern stuff uh, any of the the four symphonies eric uh although i don't i haven't listened to two as much symphony three is fantastic symphony four is wonderful symphony four is really a pastiche on mahler uh i'm waiting on demay's uh fifth symphony which should be coming out soon um, if you are planning on uh, writing Lord of the Rings based pieces, you have to get permission from the Tolkien estate. Um, uh, yeah, and I, I've got the um, the score to uh, the Demay one, um. That said, this is the, the mini score. Uh, it, I would, it's almost impossible to read because it's basically been shrunk down, <coughs> and so it's 
um, really, really hard to read, really small. Yep. Yeah, the, I, uh, yes, I absolutely remember that question. Uh, so I also go back and listen to some of the, the older stuff. There's the Stravinsky Symphonies of Wind Instruments. There's um, Olivier Messiaen's Expecto Resurrection Mortuorum. Uh, these are, you know, fantastic pieces. There's the Schoenberg Theme of Variations, Opus 43A. Yeah, you just got to get to... If you really look, most major composers will have about one band piece. At least 20th century on. And a few 19th century composers will as well. All right, guys. If there's not uh, any more questions, incantation and dance. Um, is that John Barnes' chance? Um, I I've I may have played it before. Uh, yeah, the the Tolkien estate is actually going to be very difficult to deal with. Uh, I would uh, not suggest really trying to go that route right now. Um, I know that they can be pretty litigious. Um, I, I, again, I, it, that's a, it's a, uh, cop, the copyright could expire in 2044, but my guess is that they will have it renewed in like copyright on Hobbit uh, would will be renewed I because it was published in a second edition later. So they can always go with whatever the last uh, publication is. You know, technically Mickey Mouse should be in public domain. But yeah, Christopher Tolkien is uh, highly, highly protective. So anyway, uh, we've gone down to about three or four people in here, and I've been talking for an hour and a half straight. So if we don't have really any, uh, any more questions, I'll stay on here for a couple more minutes. But, well, yeah, European copyright law, but it, remember, Tolkien's based in, in Europe, so... Yeah, you're dealing with, with English copyright law, and I I wouldn't want to mess with that. So, unless you are able to talk directly to the estate, I, I would say go with something a little bit more public domain. You can go to what Tolkien's original sources were. Go, go read Beowulf. That's completely public domain, and you have no problems using that. And that's where Tolkien got a lot of his inspiration. As you can tell, I'm, I, I am a, a bit of a Tolkien fan. I've got an entire shelf of Tolkien books here. Uh, what do I think about writing for bass trombone? It's a standard instrument. Uh, you know, every band piece I write has bass trombone in it. It's you know. It's expected unless you're writing for junior high band. Anything else, you're writing for bass trombone. I think uh, a lot of people write bass trombone way too low, uh, thinking that it's this a uh, full octave lower than the tenor trombone. And while ba some bass trombone players can do it, it doesn't really sound that good down there. It's, you know, can, but should you? Not really. Jackson, are you just now joining us? Yeah, we're just about to, to wrap it up, I think. So if you've got any real burning questions, go ahead and ask them now. 
Um, I'll probably be wrapping up here in just a few minutes. All right, guys. Well, I think I am going to go ahead and head on out. Uh, is it possible to make a low C extension for a low E flat bass clarinet? Yes. Um, you uh, a a good instrument repair tech can do it. Um, I I've talked pretty extensively with uh, the clarinet maker Steve Fox uh, about uh, low C extensions. And he's actually given me all his measurements. So uh, I, uh, at some point when my um, woodworking and metalworking skills are a little bit better, I will be um, working on making low C extensions, but that's down the road. Is soprano trombone basically useless? No, it's, it's perfectly fine. It's the piccolo trombone that's useless. Uh, the piccolo trombone does not have seven positions it only has five positions so you can't play c out in six position because six position is off the horn uh but soprano trombone perfectly fine it's this it sounds like a slide trumpet though all right anything else uh jackson uh if you you're looking at a low c extension for a low e flat bass clarinet you're looking at probably two grand from a uh, a repair tech to do it it's it's a lot of work uh i'm trying to think there it are a few modern orchestral pieces that use soprano trombone um is it Leggetti? No, it's not Leggetti. it's uh john tavener tavener uh, who uses soprano trombone in, I believe it's the Celtic Requiem. Uh, what do I think about composers copying the tuba part to low reeds? I think they're lazy. Write parts for those instruments. Copy and paste is fine. I use copy and paste all the time, but it's uh, always well thought out why I'm doing it. Uh, advice for writing a symphony, orchestra, uh, orchestra or band. Uh, have you written anything smaller yet? That's the, the first question. Do not start a symphony unless you uh, uh, have done something smaller. You think low reed should be on a marching field? Not generally. I don't think anybody should be on a marching field, though. Uh, should I write a trombone quartet? Yes. All right, Ethan, what have you written before? It'd be a good place to start, and how much composition uh, experience do you have? Practically none. Well, uh, you know, if you don't know, I do offer composition lessons. You can find that through my, my website. If you want to just contact me directly, I can uh, set up uh, composition lessons. I think the rates are on my website. Do that through Skype lessons. Um, you know, I can give... You believe just some string pieces and maybe band pieces. Either you believe that you've written them. Or we have amnesia there. Uh, uh, 
why is the E flat not use uh, alto horn not using the American Wind Ensemble? Uh, I don't know actually. Uh, mostly because I don't know. It there's a whole history there, and it was never seen as it was always seen as a replacement instrument, and never uh, instrument. Um, on its own merit. Alto horn versus alto trombone. Pistons versus slide. Conical board versus cylindrical board. I mean, they're, they're different sounds, they're different functions, they're different usage. Have you ever written any solo on a company instrument pieces? Yes. Oh, absolutely, uh, you know, write uh, on a company pieces. Uh, I'll do some of that stuff on commission. Um, it's at, unaccompanied I instrumental solos are actually incredibly difficult to write. Yeah, if, if finishing the piece is perhaps the most difficult. Uh, I am supremely guilty of this because somewhere deep in my files, I think I have like between six and eight unfinished symphonies. And we're talking, sometimes it's like 30 minutes of music that are just sitting there unfinished and will never be finished. So uh, the fact that I've, I've got two complete uh, and the third one on the way that will get completed. I, I'm confident that this one will get completed. Um, you know, <laughs> a lot of it's, it's trial and error. Symphonies are perhaps one of the most difficult things to compose. It, do you think the design of the bassoon should change to a more modern design? Why is it not changed in a long time? Uh, they have tried changing the bassoon. The problem is... The more you change the design of the bassoon, the less it sounds like a bassoon. Uh, so uh, a few years back, Wolf came out with a completely redesigned bassoon, and it didn't sound like a bassoon anymore. So... it's Bassoon is such a, a weird instrument uh, that it's, it's very difficult. Uh, the... The most important thing that really should be uh, incorporated is just the automatic octave system, the, the new flickless design. Is there anything to indicate controlled blasting maintaining tone? Uh, you've got you've got an oxymoron there. Controlled blasting. That that's not a thing. You're either blasting or you're controlled. You're not both. I think you mean the, the marking fortissimo, FF. Mark that, that's what you want. You don't really even need to go above fortissimo, the three or four Fs. What instrument do you think has the largest usable range within a wind ensemble? Well, this isn't a, a think. This is, real, you know, piano. <laughs> um, if you're going to go with wind instruments, you're going to go with the bass clarinet. Uh, bass clarinet has uh, four usable octaves, uh, followed by bassoon and the uh, other clarinets. Uh, then you're probably uh, looking at the horn. So they're they're about three and a half octave. Yeah, I know, John. Um, I uh, talked to him quite a bit. Um, I absolutely love his, his, I think his best piece is the frozen cathedral bar none. I, I don't think any of his other works really compare, um, compositionally to that one piece.
how often do you write cues for other instruments? Probably not as often as I should. Um, in general, my view is if you don't have that instrument, you're not playing my piece. Uh, I am of the uh, of the opinion that if you don't have have all the instruments, you don't really you should not be playing that piece. Uh, I, I mentioned that to Kelly. Can't I, I don't I don't like to Kelly's orchestrations. Um, I think they're they're boring. They're uh, I've pl I've played um, most of his big stuff, uh, Symphony Two, Angels and the Architecture. Uh, I never liked any of those pieces because eh, it's like okay, yeah. Um, there it's just. It's bland. It's it's this just hard pointillism. Um, what specific what special instruments think should be added to the window? So, uh, Jackson, if he had been here at the very beginning, that was probably the very first question that got asked, and I I think my my default answer is always uh, bass oboe on that. Uh. Yeah, I, I I I won't disparage him as a composer. He's probably a, a great composer. I just think his, his orchestrations uh, lack finesse. Pieces that are popular that you don't like. Oh, there, uh, there's lots of them. Um, I mean, I don't like the majority of Aaron Copeland's music. I, it's never uh, spoken to me personally. I just. I'd be fine if I never have uh, happened to to listen to any Copeland. Yeah, Sousa, Sousa could write a melody. Uh, past his melodic writing ability, it gets it gets a little boring. Um, but yeah, there there are. You know, it, it's with like anything you you find the things that speak to you and the find the things that don't speak to you. And if it doesn't speak to you, I don't listen. That's as much as it, as it is. But I also, if I don't like it, I try and figure out why I don't like it. Uh, for for someone like Copeland, I just don't like his his particular chordal harmony. I don't. It it's it's lacking uh, this depth of texture. It's very open and sparse, and I'd, I'd much rather have uh, a lot more complexity to it. Also, something about uh, a. A New York, uh, uh, you know, a New York native writing about the American West as someone who lives in the American West it just seems a little disingenuous to me. All right, guys. Uh, well, um, who's your favorite modern composer, Hazo or Galente? I don't uh, listen to either of those, so I couldn't really tell you. Favorite marches. Uh, favorite, I'd probably have to say the uh, march from Hindemith Symphonic Metamorphosis on themes of Carl Maria von Weber. Fourth movement of that piece. I think that's probably my favorite march. Yeah, uh, Jonathan, it, it, I don't tend to listen to a lot of stuff that's uh, basically written for high school band. So I'm not really going to be listening to someone like Hazo. And I don't know the name uh, Galante. So I, maybe one I'll have to look up, but I just, I'm familiar. All right, guys, we have any more questions?
Well, uh, guys, I've basically been talking for nearly two hours straight. My uh, my voice is getting a little tired. So I think I'm going to call it done for the day unless there's any last minute questions. Um, and I'll get this um, edited down and put up on the, the YouTube for people to watch. Uh, so any further questions, we got about one more minute and then we'll go ahead and uh, end our stream today. All right, guys. Well, it's been a, a pleasure. I'll do this sometime again next month. Um, I'll probably put out um, a uh, uh, an update for it. The uh, awesome. Uh, I don't deal with uh, useless. Um, everything has its use, so we're not not going to get there. Um, thanks guys. Um, like I said, I'll get this put up on, um, on the, the channel and we'll see some of you guys again next month. So probably here in a couple weeks. All right, guys. Thank you.